Hello and welcome to the e-commerce playbook podcast. My name is Andrew Ferris and I am so glad once again that you are with me for another week. This week, taking a step a little bit away from the specifics of 4x400, we might get into that a little bit, but um, instead looking at um, an incredible data set that is just coming live and public. Uh, I think it is the the most robust data set available in public about the world of e-commerce right now, getting into all things related to iOS 14 and how it's affected things outside of the anecdote of your stories and mine and all the things that are going wrong and all the things that are, there's not a lot going right for people, all the things that are going wrong, or are they? We're going to get outside of anecdote. That's the point. We've got a giant uh, data set. And to guide us through that, we've got I've got two people with me, uh, Taylor Holiday. <laughs> Say hi, Taylor. Sup? That's just like <laughs> that's like a, I just have to, to do that after being. It's become a thing now. <laughs> Hello, intro. everyone. It's great to see you. A dumb intro from Taylor. It's great to see you also. Uh, the CEO of Common Thread Collective and the Vice President of Marketing at Common Thread Collective, Aaron Orendorf, back in action on the show. Hello, Aaron. Incredibly excited and thrilled to be here. Great tee up, despite and listen. I was hoping for a terrible suck. I was very tempted to do something else, but hey, listen, we gotta we gotta get to it. So let give the people what they want. All right, this is gonna be a really cool episode. Um, so so uh, hang with me. This I think this will be. I think honestly, not like anything that is out there besides this in terms of the availability of data from the largest from a really large set of of uh, brands. And so. Um, so Aaron is going to guide us through it. Stay tuned, hang in, and we'll jump into it. All right, so um, I'm actually going to uh, do something a little bit different today, uh, gentlemen, which is that I am going to step out of the host chair, and I'm going to instead be, uh, I don't know what that puts what chair that puts me in, but it's not the host chair. The host chair is going to be passed over to Aaron, because Aaron, you've been looking at this data set and... Um, and so maybe you can start by uh, giving people some context for what we're about to get into um, and then lead us down the discussion pathways that you would like to lead us down. I, I like how you opened the introduction with getting outside of the anecdotes, because the, the last thing I want to do is is come in and pretend that the anecdotes aren't real or the the emotional and financial reality that a lot of our clients at the e-commerce world at large is living within right now. What we want to do is try to provide uh, is there a larger picture that you can benchmark yourself and your own performance against? Um, and especially, I think what I want to call out is uh, inside this data set, are there, are there things that you as a business owner or a marketer should be looking at outside of the traditional, what are really like, oh crap, oh shit sort of moments right now in e Can I, can yeah, they- can I? Could I add to that, Eric? Because I, I think there's something here that I, I, I think is really important. Um, and it's sometimes easy to sound like the people sitting on the information uh, saying like, your, your anecdotes are bad and our data is good. But what I want to actually do is to stand alongside of you in acknowledging um, what we're both attempting to do when we pursue information and questions and why anecdotes can be really powerful deception in the midst of that for all of us, myself very much included, is that I'll give you an example of an interaction that I think I'm subject to and we're all subject to. You're having a bad day on your, in your Facebook ad account and CPMs are up meaningfully in your ad account and you are searching for reason. You are searching for an understanding to take action. And so maybe like you... Uh, like many of you, like I have, have, would take to Twitter with a question like, is anyone seeing CPMs up? Um, My account is getting smashed. Okay. And you're look, you're searching for a deeper understanding, but what you actually receive back, I would contend is actually like toxic to you. Um, And what I mean by that is you receive back from someone an individual response that likely triggers them because they commiserate with you in some way. Um, I'm also experiencing that. Hey, and now we've created this perception that we are actually experiencing a macro factor that's beyond us because there's these two shared experiences and we all, we all have this, but the reason why that, uh, can be really deceptive is because that doesn't actually mean anything about the macro Facebook environment. And when you assume that the issue 
is unrelated to your individual instance and decision-making, and you presume it to be external or native to the platform itself, it really shapes the way you begin to think about solving the problem or alleviates yourself of obligation to resolve the problem. And I want you to know that I fall victim to this. And what we're hopeful to do with this information is to help add another layer of context to those questions in a way that can potentially provide um, a richer narrative than just an individual anecdote or response from anybody. That's the headline total data set we'll be updating weekly. It's already live on our Facebook ads ISO 14 article, and we've broken it down into two major sets by time. Uh, Year over year, Uh, an all-in year to date, and then looking at just the last 28 days, year over year. Inside the first big data set, we're going to be examining four metrics. Facebook reported ROAS, marketing efficiency rating, total ad revenue divided by total spend, often referred to as blended ROAS, Facebook CPMs, and average Facebook spend per account, per store. That sets the stage for it. Uh, and what, I, what, I, what I'm really interested in doing is essentially saying, here's what we're seeing. This is what the data says is happening. Uh, and there's some nuance to that. The way we look at it, if we look at it just, you know, year to date versus previous year to date, if we look at it in these smaller time frame windows, if we divide it, and you'll see inside the, the stats, the, the charts, we've divided them in some cases between pre and post iOS 14.5 full rollout. But those are the four... Those are the four metrics we're going to dive into and spend the majority of our time on first. So, gentlemen, what I want to do is essentially reveal the the chart itself. Facebook reported rows. In fact, I'm going to zoom in on this just a little bit. Dark blue line is from 2020. Light blue line, if you're tuning in on YouTube, is 2021. Uh, And then we've got our dividing line here for basically end of May, iOS 14.5 full release. So there's a lot of context here, which is awesome because we were able to see um, a a lot of major moments happening in one chart, right? Which is iOS 14 this year, which we're all talking about. But of course, last year, what we were all talking about initially was... Uh, the pandemic in the beginning of that. And then soon after just the pandemic itself, it was uh, how the pandemic is affecting e-commerce, which moved moved us swiftly into supply chain stuff as well. So you've got like all of these kind of th- factors swirling all around ROAS in one chart across how many, you say like over 200, over 200 brands or something like that. Yeah. So, um, 200. so, so 200 brands representing lots and lots of money and spend and sort of here's the total ROAS of all of them together. Right. I mean, so yeah, pretty Pretty, pretty awesome. So you can really see kind of how this is affecting all of at least our kind of e-commerce, right? Like probably less representative of, you know, mega public company things, but pretty representative of pretty much everybody else. Yeah. And I, I think, um, man, there's so much here that we can, the, we're going to get into in a second, but Start with what it shows. Give me, give me the headline. Like yeah. Taylor, uh, Aaron, you want to take the headline? What's the, what do the numbers show across the year? Facebook reported ROAS is down. Shocking. <laughs> Huge reveal. Facebook reported ROAS is down. In fact, and I can quantify that year to date. So excluding anything past October, all right? We're just we're just looking at year to date so far versus year to date in 2020. Uh, and quantify that for you. In fact, I have, right? The average weekly ROAS was a 2.01, excluding November and onward in 2020. This year, the average is 1.78. So it's down 10.8%. Year over year, year to day. Okay? And the reason we drew that line in between, okay, end of May, is because we're also interested in seeing, okay, what is, are there any macro effects on... Facebook advertising, Facebook reported ROAS. And I'll ask you gentlemen just a second. In fact, I'll ask you right now. Wh- why do I keep repeating the word reported? Yeah, well, so well, so right, here's one of the questions here, right? Which is like, the moment I see this ROAS number, I have two questions, which is our attribution model changed. So there's a there's a challenge. It, so, But I know this is normalized for seven-day data across, across all the accounts, right? So if, if you're sitting here wondering, you know, the last year's numbers include 28 days, they don't. 
So seven day, yeah. seven day data for everything. And then, but secondly, of course, like one of the things we all know happened with iOS 14 is that the actual, it's not necessarily before you say anything about the performance, we know that the data is sketchier. <laughs> and so like, yeah. there's a question about, I don't know, Taylor, if you want to nuance that differently than just saying sketchier, there's a lot we could say. Well, so let's just use what Facebook themselves has declared, setting aside what we would sort of say that we've analyzed is that there's um, a collective about 15% signal loss following that moment, right? So if you just use that as a baseline, and then you can sort of do your own work on an individual application to your own brand, we would say that the ROAS reported now is incomplete, I think is a good way to say it, <clears throat> is that there is revenue missing. There is more revenue. And if you added more revenue against the spend, because the spend number is not altered in any way, right. there's no there's no diminishment of the measure of spend, but there's a diminishment of the measure of revenue. That's going to then mean that reported ROAS is actually lower than, or is lower than what's actually occurring. Yeah. Um, so that's really important. Now, I think it's important that we stop, if we're going to go through these in chunks, like the year over year numbers are the ones that, like if we go to this graph, I, I would almost toss them out as being the primary thing to cite. And it's because these are just chapters of a book that are not actually right. uh, divided by the calendar. They're divided yes. by other things, right? right? Um, and so I think that is, is we're so used to in e using the calendar as the frame of reference for comparison this year versus last year. But these things are not the same in so many fundamental ways, attribution just being one of them, that that dividing line, I think, is misleading in how little it would sound like the ROAS is down. Yeah. Okay. So we I don't know if we actually said the number. Uh, so so pre-iOS and post-iOS, did we actually say it? I know you 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 hovered over it for the YouTube people, but for, for the e-com. So pre-iOS, January to May, 2.13 ROAS. Post-iOS, uh, 1.46 for a drop of just over 30% in reported ROAS. Um and that's that's a, that's a giant number, man. That's a that's a that's a big drop off, especially when you talk about the fact that the front of the year, theoretically, should be a low row ass time of year, relatively speaking, because you got January and February in there. Uh, I mean, certainly in twenty twenty, well, I don't twenty twenty, you got to throw out, but um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, at least for some brands. So I just think you you look at so so what you're getting at again is these lines of delineation. So one marker that I think is really important. Um, to look at is right. Like, so let's all just sort of reference COVID, right? And if we call COVID really the last two weeks of March and Aaron, if you could hover your mouse over that, um, you see that this is, this is an inflection point and everybody knows this, right? That April and May of 2020 were these significant outliers of performance. And you see it like the, you, the Ross jumps almost to basically 2.7 on average. Um, and it really, really takes off. And then what you see is that if you draw the line, like basically if you follow 2020 into the first half of 2021, you see that like the COVID effect lasted a long time. Basically like, a year. Yes. Basically a year of meaningful impact on performance uh, in the ad account that we were all riding in the first quarter of 2021. But then this is where it becomes almost this more dramatic impact because our baseline expectation had been raised and then all of a sudden the floor drops out. And if you think about 30% as a number, um, very few brands, I would say, can sustain profit with a 30% reduction in an ad efficiency. It just, it becomes non-viable at 30%. Um, and I think that's really an important thing to consider as we start to look at some of the spend numbers of why if your reported ROAS was down 30%, you would have no choice but to not spend those dollars. Yeah. So I, I think there's, as far as like takeaways from this, I mean, one, thing I, one thing that, as you're talking about sort of the chapters of the book here, Taylor, one of the things that I'm thinking about is just like, and this is something I harp on, I guess, this is maybe too hobby horsey, but like, I don't know, you, you two, you two, well, no, if this is too much of a hobby horse, but I just think about how impossible this would have been to predict um, in terms of like, because because first, first off, actually, one of the like, I mean, so COVID happens and and nobody could have predicted that. Right. And then nobody could have predicted that the impact would be incredibly positive for our businesses because of the way the government responded and the way that businesses shut down and all of those kinds of things, you know, man, at home mandates, buying online, all that stuff. And then 
you probably could have predicted some supply chain disruption, but like the way it has lasted as long as it has, like, I mean, nobody really knew how long this thing was going to last and all that kind of stuff. And then what nobody could predict again was that one of the biggest players in the space was going to drastically change the way that the other biggest player in the space measured all of this stuff. And so like one of my just kind of immediate reactions to this chart, actually, even more than anything else, is like to think a little bit more to the point you made, nobody can sustain a 30% drop off in ROAS is to think like, man, we, that like the, the concept of the anti-fragile business and, and even just sort of like building your business to not be too leveraged here. Like, I, I think there's going to be a lot of entrepreneurs who learn a lesson over these two years that is going to stick with them for a long time. I know I've been thinking about it a lot. Hopefully it sticks with them. I've been thinking about it yeah. a lot. And I, I've been thinking about just like, um, like, man, what has this taught me about this whole thing? Because for a long time, all of us were talking about the over-reliance on Facebook as a problem. But the, 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 the way we talked about that was like, oh, you've got to go be able to spend more money on other channels, right? That was the way that we talked about it. So it was like, the answer to the over-reliance on Facebook was make sure you're spread out uh, also on YouTube and on, uh, on TikTok or Snap or whatever, you know, whatever the thing was at the time. Um, and, um, and I, I think that's, that would, I guess, probably help if you were there, but I think, you know, it's not probably going to really solve. They're, the not, they're subject to the same iOS issues. Right, exactly. They're, they're not, exactly. Right? And so, so, so for me, like, I, I just kind of think about this and go like, so I was always actually kind of skeptical of that advice. Cause like, no, Facebook is better than those. Why do I have to care about all of that? And well, the answer what is what I actually really had to care about was, um, what I actually had to care about was building a business that is more structured to withstand major, both good moments to be able to take advantage of those and then problems when they come. Um, and yeah. I think, honestly, I think that's as much about capitalization and finance as it is about anything else, which is, which totally. is I mean, diverse, not about diversity. Diversification is not, uh, like if we think about this from an investing principle, is not buy a similar stock with the same risk factors. That's right. right? Like that's not what, that's not what diversification is, right? Like you don't diversify Facebook with Snapchat stock, right? Like that's not, you diversify it into a different industry or sector that is functions on different elements of risk, right? That different macro factors affect it. And so to the, the key here is to now to think about like the other revenue composition. And so one of the things we always talk about, right, is this idea of the revenue layer cake. You can go look at our forecasting articles where we talk about this, where your revenue is comprised of your existing customers who you, you capture demand for your existing customers through owned audiences, namely email and SMS. Now, they share a risk factor here, which they're actually experiencing in terms of Apple and privacy and all of these things, but it's less dramatic in the way that it appears. Now, the second layer is organic demand. You think about this in terms of uh, you know search and direct traffic and overall brand awareness. And then the top of the layer is paid acquisition, right? So those are sort of the three ways you can acquire customers. And what we've sort of always stated is that the top layer paid is subject to the most volatility. Um, now you could debate this in, in, in terms of whether organic search is subject to meaningful volatility by Google. And they all are, they all are subject to some, but tr trying to forecast over the last two years into this environment has been an insane impossible. exercise. It's impossible. Right. Yeah. It's an impossible yeah, exercise. So, so, right? so this is the point is like build for flexibility. And that's, I mean, right. listen, it's so easy to say, you know, it's, but it's, it's pretty hard to do. Um, but yeah, I, it's just definitely something that I've been thinking about as I've been thinking about this whole problem. And I, I think like, especially relative to your goals, Taylor and I, you and I were talking the other day about, this is going to ruffle some feathers potentially, but like, um, but let's go, let's bring the hot takes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, no, you were talking about how there's sort of um, a lot of, um, there's, there's, it's people kind of beat their chests a little bit, or there's sort of a pride around bootstrapping a business. Um, yeah. and, and of course, like, first of all, if you've successfully bootstrapped a business, amazing job, great work. <laughs> like this is not to, this is not to be mean. Um, but your comment was that actually might just reflect a lack of capitalization. Like that, or that, that might reflect a poor set of thinking about capitalization for the out, kind of outcomes you're going for. And I think that's part yeah. of the deal here is like, if you are trying to create a nine figure exit or something like that, you know? bootstrapping might be dumb like you know for, for it's gonna be such an extreme edge case for the kind of brand that can actually do that um 
and, and and so and and even at a smaller scale, if you're trying to like take your brand to grow super super fast and hit a big revenue super fast, well, you're gonna have to do that with something like Facebook and like blitz it really really hard, and um and you're gonna have to get great at that. And there's a, there listen, there's some people for whom that works, and those stories rise to the top. But like the if you're so leveraged there because of that outcome you're pursuing, it's gonna create a lot of challenges for you in terms of like when these kinds of crazy things happen, you know? And, and whereas if you thought about your, if you're like, okay, I'm a bootstrapping person, like maybe that means, and maybe you just need to get honest with yourself about this. I need to uh, have different goals relative to how fast I'm going to grow because these things like creating organic demand and generating returning customer revenue, they don't happen quickly. Right. Um, And and they're not most times they're not, you don't explode on them. The, The beauty of Facebook is that it's quick. And, um, yeah. and, and that's not a problem. That's a good thing. I like Facebook ads. I'm still spending, you know, like, but it's just like, um, you, you just might have to think about how that part of your media mix plays into your goals. I think. I think any dogma by which you define yourself by a strategy that eliminates then any other strategy yeah. is like a bad idea. Like you do this by saying, I, we don't use paid media. We only grow organically. You do this by saying, we are only direct to consumer, not omni-channel. We don't like retail. You do this by in, in lots of ways in which it's, I'm a you know bootstrapper versus I raise money. No, no, no. Like your job as the founder is actually to deploy the right strategy. And I would like to keep as many options available versus some positional you know, ideological framework that I've developed because of some like likely – you know, narrative I have about myself or about what I believe around the world by my worldview that like when you eliminate optionality, like it's not, a, that's not a great thing for you as a, as a founder. And yeah. I, you know, again, I'm subject to this as much as anybody. So I, I'm not, this isn't shame on all of you. It's just for all of us to consider. We've thought a lot about this, Andrew, when we've talked about four by 400 as a direct to consumer holding company, like what an unnecessary thing to define. What, ahead of what, time. what am I doing? Not putting bamboo earth in retail a year and a half ago. What if, like we're doing it now, but like what, why didn't we get it on Amazon a long time ago? What were we, what are we right. doing? It was so stupid. Right. It was so dumb. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> like, and it's dogma, right? It's like you develop a, an idea that you feel like obligated to operate within. Yeah. Or I'm or not good at that. I'm not. That's why. Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. So, and I think, so if we go to the next, if we could go into yeah. the so, MR, uh, Anything else you want to say I, about ROAS, Taylor? Well, so I, I think that one, it's the, probably the one, the metric that I'm like, we all know is suffers the most sort of integrity issues. It's also subject to, you know, uh, it, it, lots of intricacies in terms of the definitions. But but why? that's why I'd like to go to MER for a second. I don't know if that's next, Aaron, or not, because I think it ties two of these things together in an interesting way. That's that's next. Okay. It's almost some of the most interesting uh, uh, of the big picture data is MER. So rather than rather than jump right into MER, which does lead in well with, with the anti-fragile, with uh, revenue layers, all, all that good stuff. Um, I think the more direct implication or what we could say sort of maybe one of the the confluence of factors is then how this affected uh, CPM, CPMs, and then as a result, spend. And then to kind of come back to like, okay, so what happened to MER as a result of these, all these factors conspiring? ROAS dropping precipitously from... So the, the, the continuation of COVID arbitrage, buying underpriced traffic, right? uh, that, that dropping, and then the effects here, supply chain constraints, et cetera. So I'm going to skip very quickly past, don't even look at it, down to the- <laughs> I think that's uh, smart. And MER is such a summary metric at the end of the day. So it will, it will yeah. help us bring the whole thing together, I think. So what we're looking at now is Facebook's uh, e-commerce Facebook spend. This is average account. Um, Trying to give us a. This is why we do average um, because we, we've we've got larger businesses coming into Statless, um, but uh, sort of normalizing it for ourselves, which basically boils down to about 12k per week across the year for 2020, excluding holidays. Fifteen thousand and some change for 2021 which is a 28% increase year to date, year over year for 2021 versus 2020. But then we look at the, right, our friendly graph here of the ISO 14 line in about May. Uh, And this to me is not at all surprising, right? You can narrate the, if efficiency appears to fall off a cliff, 
then what do you what do you do? You spend less. Which is this is so reflective of the one input large behavior. I don't know if you call it a problem or just that that seems to be that my hypothesis here is that's exactly what it, it appeared to lose efficiency, it did lose efficiency. And so yeah. you put less money there. Now, I, I have an interesting application of this directly to CTC itself, but I want to pause on top of here's the spend, right? Uh, implication, applications, insights, wrong ways that I'm even thinking about it right now, Taylor or Andrew. So I'll tell you the most interesting thing on this graph to me. Like the, the this thing you're describing that people spent less money when iOS hits, I think we all would like not be surprised by that at all. Now, whether it was the right decision or not, I think is, is an interesting conversation. But I actually think that if you think about the graph we just looked at, right, which was ROAS over the same time period, what you'll notice is that the spend in ROAS don't line up. And, in, and most notably, what was the highest ROAS period in that graph? It was COVID arbitrage in April and May of last year. So you're, you have peak ROAS in April and May of 2020. But wait a second, go back down. We, you're saying we spent more money or that the brand spent more money in 2021, April and May? But what is it? The ROAS was so high. Well, why didn't they spend way, way, way more money when the ROAS was amazing? And this speaks to what we're talking about with the anti-fragile is that they, they actually couldn't. They didn't have enough to sell to actually maximize that moment. And people are just... It's funny, they are more interested in pulling back in the in the presence of acute performance than they are in increasing in the presence of acute success. They don't, they're much more risk averse. And I, this goes back to our Kalo days, Andrew. We used to talk about this all the time. Why aren't we spending way, 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 way more? And it's because you're not actually conscious of what the upside actually might be. And we weren't all clear enough how real this was. And so you become hesitant and you don't have the inventory because you're actually not flexible enough to scale into wins. So that to me is like the thing that I jumps out of me right away. Yeah, I'm actually, it's actually amazing. Uh, yeah, to think about that. I think I, the first of those explanations, I would have been the only one I thought of, right? The notion of like supply chain disruptions, which is another thing we all know about. And so the spend decrease just reflects that. I didn't think about the idea that some people were just nervous. Uh, and that like- It was, the, yes, they didn't know. Is yeah. this real? Yeah, right. And so they're just- they didn't take advantage of the moment as much as they maybe should have relative to the opportunity in front of them. Um, yeah, we wrote that article. I remember I released that article in May because what I was experiencing was like, hey, everyone, I think we're in the middle of a black swan event, but you're all not acting like it. And in the same way, like on the opposite side, sometimes we're slow to react or whatever, but but it was so clear that something really novel was happening in terms of this arbitrage moment that what everyone should have done was spend as much money as humanly possible to acquire as many profitable customers as they could because it wasn't going to last forever. Um, but that's not how businesses think. They think like, I had a plan and I built to this and maybe I can increase it a little bit. But when those windows open, they don't stay open forever. Yeah. And I, I built my forecast and now we beat it. Great. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. You know, the other thing that really jumps out to me here actually is um, that the current level of spend. So, um the current level of spend this graph is showing in 2021, sort of post iOS, within about a month and a half, it dropped from uh, around 20 grand a day to it looks like 13 grand a day. Gigantic drop. That's a that's a that's like a huge number, right? 30 some odd percent. Um, so, which is funny because that was that was exactly what the um, ROAS drop was. That's really interesting. So the spend dropped almost totally commensurate at that moment, at least with the with the ROAS drop. I, at least averaged out. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, the, um, the, the question though, what that, uh, that, or the thing that I was thinking about was that the spend right now is almost exactly what it was last year at this time of year. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was the first time in the history of tracking our data set that we ever had a year over year reduction in it in six years. Really? First time. Yep. Super interesting. Yeah. And, and I just wonder kind of what that reflects about last year versus this year. And, and what all is happening in terms of just like, is there sort of a, a, um, a normalization happening? And I guess, you know, the question that I, that I wonder about is sort of like, what do you think happens next? I just sat and said, you can't predict this sort of thing, but like, 
essentially like I'm really bullish on Facebook's future as an ad channel, as an ad channel, because I just think they're going to keep solving some of these core problems. Um, yep. And so when I think about well, when inventory, we get to ER, I, think it, I think it's where the that? answer lies. Right? I think when we get to MER, we start to get closer to the answer. Yeah, right. Well, um, well, what does it say is like, as far as, as far as specifically spend goes, what I think is most likely to happen is that Facebook will keep solving the reporting issue um, over yeah. time and that they'll keep solving things from an sort of algorithmic perspective, maybe not as good as it was, but still pretty good. Um, people will build up more and more uh, brand awareness over time if they can survive basically. Um, and, yeah. and their ads will be more effective and they'll learn and they'll get better and they'll release new products and they'll do all the things that brands do. And, um, and so they'll, they'll grow and they'll, they'll do well. And especially again, this is, this is from an agency. So like you're going to, you've got a bunch of like super experts working on these accounts. And so they should be able to over time work with smart founders and, and grow them. Um, and so, so yeah, so I, I think like there's something to be said here um, about like sort of what's coming next. And I guess the question I have is when I think about this from a spend perspective, how do I, how do I do exactly what I just said on the last one, which is like build my business going forward now for an unpredictable next two years, just like these last two years were unpredictable to think about sort of like what that is going to, what the next spend thing is going to be. And the, the things that come to mind here for me are like um, working very hard to get better inventory financing so that you can take advantage of good moments. And that if you're stuck with a bunch of inventory um, that you, you aren't getting killed on paying giant interest rates on it. Um, that would be one thing um, really working hard. I think um, around like, yeah, I tweeted this yesterday or a couple days ago and this is, yeah, but just like sort of, I mean, giving real serious attention, real serious attention to where is my non-paid revenue going to come from so that if something happens and my spend gets, you know, cut off at the knees that I can actually survive that. Um, and then diversifying my revenue channels, I think would be another element of this, which we were just talking about, right? Wholesale, Amazon, those kinds of things. Um, so that you're not just sort of stuck D to C. I think like if I could actually do those few things together, then I'm, then I'm pretty well positioned to be flexible with whatever the next spend movement is. Yeah. So I think a great creative constraint exercise, and I do this for myself when it comes to our agency and I'll explain specifically how in a second, but, and I put out a tweet in a similar, more micro fashion before, which was like, if the only way that you could grow your business, the only marketing you were allowed to do was on your unboxing experience, how would you make your business grow? Right. And so there's a similar thought exercise, which is if you were allowed to spend zero dollars, Andrew, on Facebook next year, and you had to, if you, or else you died, increase the bottom line of Bamboo Earth by 100%, what would you do? And that's not to say that that's the strategy you deploy, but it is to say that that thought exercise for a two-hour brainstorming session with your team can produce a consideration for a, fun a way of running the business that's different than before. And we've never had to think like that before because this growth lever was so readily available. So for me, a similar exercise is like uh, on the agency side, like people are sort of the prohibitive growth factor in hiring, right? So the constraint I'll give myself sometimes thinking is that if I, could, if I was not allowed to hire another person and had to grow my profit, what would I do? And all it does is give me a new stream of forced consideration for revenue or profit growth um, that I think all of us would be well served. Now, then you get to open back up and realize you can still use Facebook and it is useful, but it it can offer you avenues of consideration that I think will help to get to less dependence. Yeah. Well, the actual thing is that if you can solve that problem, then Facebook becomes amazingly useful to you because ding, 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 then ding, ding, you can yep. supercharge the other things that you're doing. And then it really, and then Facebook really does become gas on a fire, which is like, which, so, which yes. is like, that's, and that's what you want it to be. You don't want it to be the whole fire. That's right. Um, that's right. It, it, yes. Yeah. And there's this fascinating thing about ROAS, right? Which is like, we talk about this all the time where ROAS has a constraint and the constraint is that people will spend until it yeah. like doesn't any longer produce profit. So it'll, they'll, they'll spend up until their marginal return threshold. And that usually sits somewhere around a 1.8 to a two, right. right? Like, so somewhere in there is where ROAS is always going to move towards. Um, except I think what this is going to create are the kinds of businesses that can leverage the power of Facebook, which in my mind is volume yes. more than it is right. just efficiency. And they'll build businesses where they can win at one ROAS and they'll scale like crazy at that return level. And those kinds of businesses are going to grow really, really fast in the future because they can play a different game. And I've already seen this where I've talked about this, where the businesses I've seen grow a lot over the last six months, they leverage subscription as a primary mechanism for growth because 
you can run at a loss on first order, which means you can use Facebook as a tool that generates 0.8. Same thing. This is why I think digital goods and all these other things that offer margin expansion. What it means is that Facebook is still really, really powerful. It just isn't powerful at a two and a half to one anymore. So what does a business look like that leverages this really powerful customer finder at less efficiency? Yep. Yep. Good. To me, one of the most surprising, it always, it, it surprises me and it surprises everybody I talk to about it is uh, one of our clients uh, that sells lights and knives for outdoors. And it, it's always a shocker to look at what their LTV and their MER is, you know, bolstered, their MER bolstered by LTV. And until you realize, oh, they decided to invest in battery subscriptions and their own. And, and as soon as you say that, it's like, oh, everybody goes, yeah, of course. But until you you say it out loud, it's such a, it's, it's always instructive to me to think about there's these opportunities that don't naturally lend themselves to the core product. Um, until you yeah. say it and then it sounds so obvious, yeah. but it's, it's not always. Let, let me say something about that, which is like when I tweeted the other day about something about like, you know, organic revenue or, or retention, I got a lot of responses from people saying like, okay, so what do you do? SEO, CRO, like all those kinds of things. It's, they're sort of all super tactical answers. And, um, y- yes, if you can do one of those effectively, fantastic, go, go do it. You know, I'm, I'm pro tactics, but, um, but I think what I think people forget is that those are not. <laughs> That's not all the way when you talk about adjusting like something that is sort of framed tactically like that, like customer, like re- returning customer revenue or organic revenue. It sort of is frames the question tactically. Well, what I'm actually like saying is there's all kinds of stuff. You know, you, you just mentioned unboxing Taylor as an interesting thing, you know? Um, and, but what I'm thinking about is, and, and Aaron, what you just mentioned was, was product development, basically like essentially like what products you offer are, are the way you do that. Um, and, 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 and to your point, Taylor, about like subscription, right? So if somebody hears that and they go, well, a lot of people will go, well, that's great, but I don't have a subscription product. Then make one, <laughs> figure out, you know, the answer is like, figure out what subscription product you can sell that would make sense for your business and then go sell yeah. it, right? And and that and that's not an easy problem. Like, but the point is like, that's actually in your control. Um, and, and that's yeah. the kind of thing that I think people, especially who are kind of started e-commerce brands because they're marketers, forget. And that, that took me a long yeah. time of running brands to see, uh, for sure. But that's what I'd say is like, there's, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about this kind of problem um, that are well beyond just tactics. And I'm, listen, I'm, I talk tactics all the time. I'm super pro tactics, be great at tactics, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So this idea of margin of innovation is going to lead to a lot of very different businesses in the future. Like, so one of the things I'll give you an example of how I think this comes to life. So when we were running Kalo, right, we had an LTV problem, um, Kalo is a silicone wedding ring company. Like the premise of a wedding ring in so many ways is that you buy one and wear it forever. Like, uh, and we tried to get people to buy more than one, right? But like, that was not the consumer behavior. That's a very hard thing to change. And so there was no LTV. Now it had great margin and these other things that allowed it to grow really fast. But as it continues to grow, Kalo is going to have to answer this question for itself. And so as I look at that business, I think about, um, you look at, where we missed early on, there was a few things that we considered that ended up becoming really big businesses. One example is Aura Ring. Okay. So Aura Ring developed a piece of hardware that also had a software layer that created like Whoop or, you know, Eight Sleep, a residual around software for the object, right? So that's one big thing that's going to happen is software revenue associated with the product in some capacity. Another thing that we talked about was like, we have a giant database of married people. What if we could find really qualified Married a network of family therapists. And we actually became a network broker of building connections between our customers. And we were invested in sustaining marriages. And we like built that network and that referral, all we did was refer them and we made a residual revenue off of that. So this kind of margin innovation is what I, where it's like my, when someone says my business isn't built for subscription, I'm just like, no, you're just not interested in considering ways in which it might be. Yeah. We have for bamboo earth on our skin quiz. We ask people, um, if what they're stressed about, you know, if anything. And one of the answers is finances. And I've thought for a while, I haven't done this, but I've always thought like, I sh- I wonder if there's like a referral relationship to get with like Financial Peace University or somebody like that, you know, who could sort of like be, I don't know, go research somebody that I trust as a partner to help people think about their finances and kick an email to them and say, hey, you know, maybe some maybe somebody on our team has done that kind of thing. Um, and can say, hey, one of our team members found a lot of help here. Um, and uh, just want to let you know, like, we understand it's really hard to be in financial stress. What, what I learned about myself is that this was a um, this was actually as much about my own habits as it was about sort of income. 
And, um, and so if you want to go get that and then you get a referral fee off of that or something like that, you know, I don't know. And you could do that and make it a pretty simple thing and, and maybe generate some side revenue, right? If if stress, if stress is a primary contributor to your skin breaking out and you care about beauty and this is, this is, this is what your customers have told you is the number one contributor to their stress. It is within the bounds of your mission to solve that problem, right? Like, and I, I think about this all the time, right? Like, and this is why I love in some ways. The, the mission of CTC, help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams. It gives me a lot of room to paint um, in ways that I think about that without thinking of something to do with being a Facebook ad buying agency is that I'm not in any ways tied to that as the obligation. My job is to figure out what will make businesses grow and offer them yep. that, you know? And, and I think if you can get to that place as a brand, um, you're going to have opportunity. And, and this all does tie back to Facebook because I think we should all be really leery of staring the most, a tool that billions of humans use that we can access with direct precision and saying, oh, it's not efficient enough for me. And that's right. Right. And, and so I think that's where it ties back to the spend in this tool is like, you will have a competitive advantage if you can figure out how to make your business able to use this tool, you know, and like that, that is a thing I think that we've got to consider as we go forward in the future. Yeah. Okay. What data point so we'll we'll right. into yeah. MER is, uh, pr- probably simultaneously the most, uh, I want to say painful, p- p- perhaps may- maybe, maybe less so than, than that MER drop, although, or excuse me, the, the ROAS drop, although, uh, what we're looking at now is e-commerce, Facebook CPMs. And for some, some anchor points, if you're listening in average CPM in 2020 year to date, $8 and 31 cents. Average CPMs on Facebook 2021, 1273. That's a 53.17% increase in CPMs this year. And uh, it's a vivid illustration. Go it, Because what we can see is, is like near Black Friday, Cyber Monday CPMs. Uh, already, the, the last week we got recorded here was a full week of October 31st, so a little bit into November. But near Black Friday, Cyber Monday levels already this year. What do we do with CPMs? What, what does this tell us? What are the implications? You you start by pulling up 2019 too. Uh, and, and I know, Aaron, in the newsletter that people are going to be able to subscribe to or in the data set that they can access, there is multiple years of history here um, as it relates to this. I think this is potentially, this graph almost makes me scared to publish. And, and it's because this is such a thing that people just gravitate towards as an absolution of responsibility is, is CPMs are up. And they're up. The, like That is factually correct that the advertising is more expensive this year than last year. The question I would ask, and I think it'd be really interesting to look at January of 20 versus January of 21 and see what those numbers are exactly um, in terms of the percentages, which we can do. Um, but if I recall, 2018 is actually a lot higher than or 2019, excuse me, is a lot higher than 2020 as well. So if you look at the actual increase in CPM between 2019 and 2021, it's actually smaller than the increase in CPM between 2020 and 2021. Is that That's correct? true. Yeah, what, what we yeah. had is, is actually 2021 CPMs, the closest most recent year to, to match it, and it's only slightly above, is 2018. Yeah. So this is this is why this is so interesting, right? Is that we all hearken back to, to the glory days of Facebook, but 2018 CPMs are actually higher than both 19 and 20. Yes. Um, and so a lot of what I see in this graph is, yes, CPMs are up, but it has as much to do about the de- the, the depression of CPMs in 2020 um, due to COVID. And you can see that illustrated most in March where there's the widest gap. Um, the CPMs were almost like 150% higher or whatever that is. It looks like about 1250 and $5. That's like, that is a massive gap in CPM. So when we talk about a rolling average over a period of time, I just would say that we've got to offer into it that perspective before we just go, this platform's done. It's over. Yeah. I mean, CPMs too, like they're, they're just way too reflective of too much stuff to like, in some ways, I mean, I think that the West, best way to think about CPMs, like this is an interesting data point. And I think the thing that it shows is really interesting. Exactly, exactly what you said, the story from 18 to 19 to 20 to 21. But like in that story is the dawn of Instagram stories, making making CPMs go way down at one point. And then, yep. um, and, and so like what that reflects is that uh, 
CPM is heavily connected to placement. And if you pull up your Facebook ads, you'll see that is true. Um, and then, and, and, and like who it's delivering to male, female age, all of those things. So, um, so because of all of that, like, it just doesn't tell you that much. And, and like the thing that's really fascinating in all of this to me is that the problem with an increase in CPM theoretically is that it increases your CPC. So the traffic gets more expensive because at the same click through rate, the ads are more expensive and therefore now the ads are less profitable, right? Well, wrong. Right? Uh, it turns out if every time we've ever looked at this, and I haven't looked at it from the perspective of stat list like you guys have most recently, but every time I've ever looked at this, CPC is, is sometimes actually positively correlated to ROAS. That is a higher CPC is correlated to a higher ROAS. And it's because like, yeah. What CPC doesn't factor in is is the quality of the click and the quality of the click. Better clicks are actually worth paying more for. So um, CPMs are up. Last year was a weird moment. We all know that. We all stopped spending because of we didn't have an inventory and maybe because we were too risk averse. CPMs are back up. Yep. Doesn't really scare me. That's right. I, it's just, I think it's the least useful of all of the information, yet the one that seemingly has been ingrained into our head uh, as if there is a perfect inverse correlation between CPM and ROAS, and that is just yeah. not true. It is yeah. just not true. And I, I think we all need to just recognize that. Now, there there is a threshold at which the advertising is really hard to yeah. win at. And I, like, I think you should consider the extremes and that you should, you should understand if you exist in one of those spaces where your brand can't win at a $60 CPM because you just can't convert enough traffic to make that worthwhile. Uh, and there are times where that's a factor and you have to consider how to distribute to a different audience. But I'll also say though, is that like, your bid requirement, in other words, the bid that your individual brand is required to make to win an auction has factors in it that include the quality of the engagement on that ad, the expected conversion rate on that ad, and the experience of the user with the ad, right? So there are just other things in that in that pot. So I don't know. I'm the I'm the sort of anti-CPM as a as a helpful uh metric it's so, it's funny because the reason people gravitate toward it right is because um it does feel like it absolves you <laughs> it's like it's like it does, it's yeah. like oh man the cpms were high it's not my fault and there, i mean i had a moment right. a couple weeks ago where my cpm for modern fuel day over day went through went up by three and a half x and so yeah. then our traffic went down by about three and a half x and that was not my fault but you know what happened it like self-corrected within three days and it was super annoying and we yeah. lost some money because of it and who knows what actually happened there and probably facebook owes me some money but like um <laughs> you know but like yeah. in the grand scheme of things like that it corrected so fast it was not there's nothing actually yeah. inherently wrong that was like a weird moment and so so in that kind of thing yeah i'm, I'm absolving myself I, I didn't see the three and a half x day over day cpm increase coming forgive me the um yeah but but yeah more broadly i think yeah you, you just it's interesting as a reflection of the macro environment i suppose but otherwise yeah it's not 2015 anymore and we all knew that yeah, yeah. remember 2015 Let's remember, remember 2015 then. taylor remember advertising on 2015 that was great it's fun yeah we were we were but we were scared we yeah. we, we didn't yeah but remember how good at facebook we were taylor <laughs> yeah and that that's the thing is like i i would actually contend that like the biggest thing that we displayed was lack of no, experience totally. of one hundred percent. All it was, right? Like, you know. Um, okay, so last last one here. Yeah, let's round percent. it out. Last no. one: marketing efficiency rating ratio. We've broken this down into two data chunks: year to date, year to date, pre and post iOS. Twenty twenty year to date five point seven one. Twenty twenty one five point zero two. It's twelve percent reduction. In MER. Pre and post, pre iOS 4.88, post iOS 5.61. One six, 5.16. A 5.67% yeah. 5. increase. Go, Taylor, go. 10% down oh, no. year over year, 5% yeah. yeah, yeah. up, 5% up since. End of May, I was 14.5 full release. Yeah. What what does that mean? <clears throat> um it means a lot of things, but one of one of the things um that it means strictly, right, is that like the amount of revenue that's being allocated to ad spend is um about the same. 
as a percentage of your revenue. <laughs> like that, that's roughly like objectively what it's stating. Now, why I think is an interesting question. And I think Andrew, you have a great illustration with Bamboo Earth that I'll leave to you. Like if you were to consider your MER before and after, I think it's one of the interesting ones where I think it's up like an immense amount, but I'll let you explain sort of why that is. But if we go back to the spend went down, right? Um, we know that spend went down. So if you looked at overall revenue, this doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's making the same amount of money or even that they're making more money, right? But what it does illustrate, and this is a thing that we've seen, and as we enrich, as we continue to enrich this data set, which we're going to, and we get to look at this on Statless, where we can look at an additional set of metrics like AMER, acquisition MER, where we look at like the efficiency of acquiring new customers only as an example, or we look at last click Google Analytics ROAS, and we compare those. What I'll say that we're finding Again, on aggregate, there are individual examples in both directions. There are brands that are struggling and brands that are winning. Is that there has been very uh, little impact to the actual efficiency of customer acquisition um, for these brands. And that's sort of what shows up here is that spend went down. I'm guessing if we mapped overall revenue, some of the revenue numbers went down. Um, But the efficiency, the total spend as a percentage of revenue has not changed. Um, And part of this is that brands will, again, always spend to their profitability threshold. And so four quarter accounting would tell us that uh, this is this idea that your revenue is comprised of four categories, 25% profit, 25% uh, cost of goods, 25% uh, uh, OPEX, and then 25% CAC. Now that's an idealistic makeup. Not, Not everybody actually looks like that. But what it means is that brands can only functionally afford to really spend around 20% of their revenue to get to profitability. Anything above that, and candidly, even at 20%, it's really hard to be profitable, and many e-commerce businesses are not. But this number sort of sits at that threshold and will move the volume up and down to maintain it. So it doesn't actually surprise me that MER is not that volatile all the time. Um, now, we see that last year there were moments of arbitrage, but uh, but we don't actually see... Um, Oftentimes it normalized, even in the, even in the COVID times, it came back down and, and MER will always sort of move to that number in my opinion. Yeah. So Bamboo Earth, like you said, was one of those brands that, that had exactly what you described earlier. I think it was May of last year. That was like our best, most profitable month ever. Um, and our MER was by far our best in our history. Uh, and it's because, um, we couldn't spend as much as we wanted to. And so our spend was super efficient because we were, we were sort of underspending, which increased our efficiency. Um, uh, and then, uh, on top of our spend being super efficient, um, it was lower and, um, and therefore our revenue holding pretty constant and our spend going down meant that our MER looked great all of a sudden relative to our previous performance, you know? Um, and it's sort of this fascinating thing by contrast, uh, in, uh, we've had a really hard time with acquiring customers for Bamboo Earth this year on Facebook ads. Um, last few months, especially has been really tough. Definitely a decline year over year, including measured by AMER uh, and volume. Um, and so the other day, I had um, I had something happen where um, I had some new ads that performed really, really well when I launched them, and I was really excited about it. And uh, so day over day, I was looking, and my conversion rate had dropped fifty percent site wide. And I was like, "Huh, my conversion rate dropped day over day, but my my all of this stuff got better." What is going on? And so the tweet that almost was, <laughs> this is probably the worst content ever, a thing I almost tweeted. Um, but um, but uh, well, I almost tweeted something to the effect of, my response was like, my conversion rate dropped by 50% day, day over day. Here's why I'm excited about it. And because what it reflected was that the reason my conversion rate had been so good for a while was because my spend was so bad that I was barely spending any money because I couldn't spend it efficiently at all and effectively. And therefore, I had just tanked my actual spend number. So what that meant is my total traffic pie, right, was um, was uh, a bunch of returning customers coming through all of my best channels, direct email, organic search, branded paid search, right? That was like all of my traffic mm-hmm. was that. And then uh, I had much less paid social traffic, which was my lowest uh efficient or conversion rate channel. And therefore the total pie looked amazing. My MER was incredible and it was a huge problem because, um, (laughs) this amazing 7% conversion rate or whatever it was, you know, and, and, and my six or seven MER or whatever was a big problem because what had happened is I'd stopped acquiring customers. And, and so for a couple weeks, that's fine, right? Like, it's great. You just sit on the money and everybody feels great. But in the long run, 
that is going to really hurt your business if you don't get new customers. So, um, so, uh, so yeah. So, and I think MER really reflects this, which is like, it's contextual based on this sort of thing. And eventually people are going to spend toward this. That the way I'll say that your MER doesn't necessarily spend toward this is to come back around to something we said earlier, Taylor, which is if your LTV is awesome, um, then over time you can generate incredible MER because if you hold your spend constant year over year over year, you acquire customers at the same rate, basically. Yep. You get no better at it at That's all, right. but your customers keep coming back over a long period of time, then that returning customer pie That's is right. going to grow slowly but surely and the new and the um, new customers are not. And that's the subscription businesses you're talking about as well, where, you know, they're doing a good job with their ads and all that kind of stuff. But at some point they don't do that. And, and even, especially if they're disciplined about not spending bad dollars, um, you know, right. then, then it'll just, it'll just keep growing. And so I actually, I love this idea of AMER as second, uh, separate to MER. We, we, we kind of came up with this ad hoc to solve problems at 4 by 400 but like, um, as we did, um, uh, I like it because I like thinking about that specific bucket. My spend is meant to acquire new customers. And that tells me actually something really different than just MER. And, uh, and I want to know what that is specifically. Well, that was a really yeah. important and, one for myself too, to get my head around this AMER acquisition MER, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the idea of sort of like your total new customer revenue divided by your spend, because your spend is aimed at new customers. So it's, cause you're going to have some new customers who are coming, who are, who are organic. Right. And so like, what is the total value of your spend coming in relative to, to, to that as well as other stuff? It helps, it helps you think about first order profitability on new customers too, I think is, is, a, is a good way to think about like CAC uh, to LTV or anything else like that you consider. But Aaron, can I share my screen real fast? I want to, I want to show one thing. Take it over. Um, that I think as you guys consider this, um, and what I hope these MER benchmarks help you to do is to, again, think about, whether everyone else's margin has been destroyed and it hasn't, they've made adjustments, whether, you know, like the Facebook ROAS has uh, declined a little bit or a lot. And it's like, well, we're giving you some information. What has happened with CPMs? You're, you're going to be able to place your data set amidst a broader data set. Um, that's the, that's really, you. really, yes. That's absolutely the hope and the takeaway in all of this for me is, is we can provide this big picture. And there's eight more metrics too, that are going to be updating, uh, month over month for the last 28 days. So we got these four week rolling windows on spend CPM revenue conversion rate via Facebook, Facebook ROAS, MER. And then we've also added Google CPC and Google ROAS. So you'll be able to see those and actually hover right on top of them to look at this month versus the same period last year, those, the last four weeks, 28 days. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I want to show you just one example of a brand that I think illustrates a theme Okay, and I know we're using one individual anecdote to sort of circle back on uh, a point that we made earlier that's not the case. But I want you to know that this data set is indicative of the thing I'm seeing broadly uh, and I think shows up in a similar way in the MER data that we're reflecting or the data that we're looking at right now in terms of what we've referenced. So this is a client of ours. Um, and what this, this is a report inside of Statlist that we call the iOS impact report. And what it allows us to do is to try and sort out the question of like, what was the impact of the iOS change on this business across a myriad of different metrics that we care about? So you've heard us talk about Facebook ROAS today, and you'll see for this business using this line, which we can alter the demarcation date of what we would, when we would say um, the iOS impact is. And we use, we use May 1st or yeah, May 1st for the state a lot because we track the API. And that's when we started seeing data or Facebook go back and alter the, the data. So that's sort of their reference mark for <clears throat> data integrity loss. So if we use that May 1st data point and we compare for this brand, um, we see that Facebook reported Ross is down 47%. So even above the 30% that yeah. we're saying in aggregate, they're down 47%. Could you imagine one day you show up and your Facebook ad accounts down 50%, you would panic. But as we look at this, so let's look let's look across the spectrum of these other metrics. MER, okay, what we just described, total sales over total ad spend, is actually up 10%. So in a very similar fashion to the aggregate data set where we're saying that Facebook reported ROAS is down, but MER is basically unchanged or up a, a small amount. And then when we look at these two additional metrics that I referenced earlier, AMER, so new customer revenue, it's basically exactly the same, a 1% change before and after iOS. And when we look at their last click GA Facebook ROAS, so looking at what Google Analytics is reporting and what's happening on Facebook, it's again, basically incredibly flat. And so we have to constantly alter 
our definitions of success in the Facebook ad account. And we, we go through and we, we study the correlation of each of these metrics to Facebook over time. And what we'll find often is that we'll adjust this to look at actually one day click uh, revenue as the primary thing that we'll try and compare because it has the tightest relationship with GA Facebook Ross. And you can see I can sort of adjust this to look at that. So now on a one day click basis, I'm down 37%, almost right in line with what we're seeing on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But again, Google Analytics up 6%. And so we will actually alter our Facebook targets and I'll stop my share there. 40% will change the definition of success by that amount when managing the ad account. And in doing so, we've been able to now begin to win and pick back up volume and pick back up spend and and see the profitability in the MER of this client maintained. And so this is where... I hope when I talk about these brands, these, these data sets being a doorway for you, I wouldn't assume that what's true in the aggregate is true for you, but I would go, oh, this is interesting. ROAS down, MER constant. What are we seeing across some of these metrics then for us? Maybe our Facebook efficiency isn't as bad as we think it is, or maybe it's down less. And we, if we just adjusted our bid caps a little, we might get back to volume. Like there could be answers. And that's all I'm saying is that there are questions and there might be answers. There is both commiseration shared shared need shared pain and opportunities within this that's right that's right all right well thanks guys this is a fun conversation it's fun to like step back and to zoom out and to look at something a little bit bigger aaron thanks for for hosting us and for walking us through it taylor thanks for uh doing a thing i know comes really not naturally to you which is offering some opinions on (laughs) e-commerce um for me that's always feels like a reach for myself too so um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and hopefully like this, this, this episode, Patrick, you know, you inspired part of this, uh, Patrick from supply in our last conversation about our transparency as an agency and wanting to bring to you where our opinions are formulated and where they're coming from. Yeah. And so we want to invite you into this. And so we are being massively transparent with our data and we're going to continue to enrich this and add to it. Um, so man, I hope it, I hope it helps. I genuinely mean it. I, I want I want for all of us to find success to the best of our ability. And so I hope it helps. We're recording this on a Tuesday. Patrick himself texted me yesterday and said, I'm launching my Black Friday deal as we're recording this. And I said, I guess that's more important. Go for it. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it so much. Um, And uh, yeah, we'll wrap this up in a second. Check us out on YouTube. If you've been listening in the car. We're live. We're going to record these on video and you'll see all the stuff we're talking about on YouTube, Common Thread Collective's YouTube channel. All right. Thanks so much for listening once again to the uh, e-commerce playbook podcast. As Taylor said there at the end, do go check it out on YouTube. There's a link in the show notes for you to go look at that. And so there's a, the, you can go subscribe to that channel um, and, and see these charts, see all this data for yourself. Thanks again to Taylor and Aaron for joining me today. Um, as always, we appreciate a rating and review. All of the usual podcast stuff uh, is very helpful. So um, thank you so much. And we'll be back next week. I hope your Black Friday holiday is going great. Your MER is soaring. Your spend profitably is soaring. And you are breaking these charts for next year. Have a good week. Yep.